Now, particle Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques are a technique that they represent, a, again, a family of techniques that I'm not going to spend as much time on. There's two reasons for this. Number one, they are fairly technically gnarly. In other words, um, there's a lot of details there. And um, the paper that lays them out, the seminal paper that, that established their viability and approaches, um, is in fact uh, notoriously, among mathematical statisticians, it's notoriously dense. I have provided to the attendees, I've provided to you detailed notes on that paper which lay out basically how and why the algorithm knows. I, I put it in the, um, the materials that, uh, uh, that accompany, um, uh, accompany uh, the general material online. And, and you can look at it on the Google Drive site if you're interested and glad to talk about it. But they are very dense, and uh, whilst uh, I plan to cover them more in a graduate course, I'll be teaching at this time next year. Well, perhaps not at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to, to push on them too hard for that reason. But there's another reason, too, which is more uplifting, perhaps, which is really they build directly on what we've already done. If you have some understanding of particle filtering, and you got some whiff of what I was talking about last night with, with MCMC, this idea of sampling plausible parameters, and the parameters that are more likely to get sampled more frequently, these basically are a logical extension of that. And the details of it have mathematical, mathematical tricks associated with them and cleverness. But, but really, they don't change the picture that it's, it's, it's like the heart of a lion combined with the body of a horse. Both mainid creatures of, of, uh, of significance. I was trying to describe the other day. Um, my wife, whose, whose native language is, first language is not English, uh, was just, we were discussing the word mane in English. And I was trying to think of creatures that have a mane. I can only think of two horses and lions. Are, do other creatures have a mane? Can you think of a mane? Uh, I don't know if I'd call it a bear as having a mane. Um, uh, like a, a lion has a mane, it has this, this set of hair. Well, okay. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> we could go down there a long time. But um, anyway, uh, two mained creatures. Sorry? What about zebra? Zebra has a mane. Okay, so that's, that's good. That's good. Maybe a quokka. Uh, no, no, not a quokka. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I don't know that we talk about a chicken having a mane. Because <laughs> fe feathered creatures would. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it to the audience. If, if you're bored by what I'm talking about, you can research the, 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 the widespread character of manes. I would say hennies, there's two animals that are crossbred from zebras and horses. One is a henny, and there's a, a, a yeah, there's zed something. Um, and uh, those may have manes as well, but um, <laughs> anyway. anyway um, okay, moving right along. Um, uh, so, particle MCMC, the heart of a lion, the body of a horse. Um, so, it combines, it combines particle filtering with MCMC methods. Um, it can allow for sampling from the joint distributions of parameters and system state. Now, I emphasize the joint distribution here. In other words, for you can know, okay, what are the underlying system states in the 
if the system takes like to be if you posit this value for the parameters, this set of values versus this other set of values, what are the, the distributions of the underlying system state over time likely to be? It's not that you just have distributions for each of them separately, you have joint distributions. You know sort of how they relate to one another. Um, it's extraordinarily powerful for this. This is not something we can do, I'm assured by mathematical statisticians, with safely, with particle filter rhythm alone, estimate static parameters. Um, uh, they, they, um, they say it's not really a legitimate use of particle filtering. But it is a legitimate use of particle on CMC. We can sample from parameters. Um, parameters are evolving over time. We can use particle filtering for um, those evolving stochastically. Particle MCMC is a family of algorithms. It is very computationally expensive. So quite commonly, you might do 10,000 or more MCMC iterations, each of which requires a particle filter. So we use the MCMC. Um, uh, we've applied it, great success, in the opioid area to illuminate underlying patterns um, uh, within Cincinnati um, associated with opioid abuse. Um, and uh, we commonly run our MCMC models for hours, if not days. It is a technique that can be highly parallelizable and Lugia, in addition to as many other calls to fame or claims to fame, um, uh, distinguished characteristics, he's working on this issue of speeding this up. As a computational scientist, I can tell you with some pleasure that the techniques that are expensive right now with particle filtering and particle MCMC, we believe we can speed them up dramatically probably by a factor of 10 or more. Um, so when you sense that something is very slow right now, that doesn't mean it's doomed to forever be slow. Um, okay, now as I said, it's a family of algorithms. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about is something that's technically called particle marginal PMCMC. It's one of three techniques presented in the seminal paper whose reference you can find in the background information for this boot camp. It's a paper by Andrew um, uh, and uh, Doucette, I believe, are the two authors. Um, and uh, particle marginal MCMC is a straightforward algorithm. The basic idea here, and I'm not going to be spending too long on this so I can get to embedding and CCM. Um, the fundamental idea here is to have a sampling from parameter values. That's the, what we call theta. That's our assumptions about these parameters. We don't know, we're not very confident about them. And we're gonna be estimating different values for them, drawing different possible values that are consistent with the data. But we're going to do that in a way that's joint with particle filtering. So we're going to use we're going to use MCMC to, to sample these parameter values. And for each parameter value sampled, we're going to perform particle filtering whose, whose undertaking will be assuming the sample value of the, the parameter. Okay, it's actually the, the candidate value of the parameter that's proposed. And this will allow us to sample from a trajectory Okay, from a, a trajectory of values uh, according to their weight. Um, and here we sample an entire trajectory, not just, we don't just sample the value of, you know, the likely number of people who are susceptible at this given time and, and infected and so on. We're actually sampling a trajectory of change over time sort of a, sing, a, a, a likely case of how the system might have evolved and the number of people infected or exposed, recovered, et cetera, over time. And that trajectory is sampled in this. Uh, and, and then we use that to calculate a posterior, which is used to accept or reject the, the, uh, the parameter value. And we iterate. 
we iterate uh, over that. And what we're emitting here is, on the one hand, the, the sampled um, parameters jointly with, uh, on the other, the, um, the other hand, the, uh, the sampled trajectories. So it's kind of like it's giving us a picture about what the underlying situation is in the model uh, together with um, the, the parameters that, that support that model, that govern that model. Now what's notable is in this outer loop where we're sampling the parameters, there's this kind of um, yin-yang sort of relationship here. In, in this outer loop, we are sampling theta based on an understanding that the latent state of the system was as sampled last time. The trajectory was as sampled through the last time through this inner loop. And then we are doing the inner loop, uh, assuming that the parameter value is as, um, as picked uh, as the candidate value in the outer loop. So you kind of go back and forth between performing particle filtering, assuming this uh, candidate value uh, being considered for MCMC, and performing MCMC, assuming that the last thing picked for particle filtering was correct. So you go back and forth between these jointly, um, uh, jointly um, evolved a sampling from trajectories and from parameter values, okay? Now, I'm not gonna go into all the mathematics of this, uh, for sure, it's actually rather gnarly, but essentially, we're finding a set of uh, vaguely plausible parameters, uh, things that lead to non-zero posterior density, things that have face validity, they, they at least can explain one possible hypothesis for the data. And then basically, we, we uh, sample, uh, find a candidate value for theta, um, and we then, um, we then perform particle filtering. Um, and uh, the particle filtering is performed in order to evaluate the probability as to whether to accept this, this sample. And we accept it um, with the probability as, as determined. Um, and if the probability, the posterior probability for this new sample is greater than the current one, we go there. We, adopt those parameters. Uh, if it's not, we adopt it with a certain probability. We roll a dice and, and figure out if we're going to accept it. The, the point is that the particle filtering samples a trajectory of values over time, which is used to assess the likelihood of observing the data. Um, so the particle filtering is performed, we sample one trajectory, and we use that to compute the likelihood of observing the data given the parameters um, uh, and, and the sample trajectory. And that is used to compute this, um, uh, compute the posterior um, uh, at this, uh, at this uh, candidate point, and we compare it to the old one. I recognize this is not gonna be clear to most of you um, because we, we haven't had a chance to go into the deeper mathematics, I would refer you to the, um, to the coverage that I have provided to you. But the basic idea here is we're doing MCMC draws. We, we pick parameter values that are candidates. We, for each of those candidates, we perform particle filtering. We say, um, hey, give me a single trajectory that's most likely over time for the system if I assume this parameter value is from the candidate. We get that trajectory, we use that to determine the likelihood of observing this empirical data, given that that's actually what went on in the underlying system, and these are the parameters. What's the likelihood I'd observe this, this observed data? So given that this trajectory says there were very, very few people who should have gotten infected during this time, but I observed data that says there were a lot, I'd say, oh, that likelihood is very small. And it's unlikely to pick that candidate value. It's unlikely to adopt it. It'll say that candidate value is a worthless value. I'm not going to accept it. Or it'll be very unlikely to accept it. And it will stick perhaps with the more likely ones. So you're going back and forth between particle filtering and drawing a parameter. Where the parameter is drawn 
with a likelihood, or is accepted with a likelihood is determined by the latent trajectory picked from particle filtering. And the particle filtering is occurring based on assuming the candidate value as, as the, the parameter value. So you're going back and forth between these and accepting. And we have a code base we'll be sharing with you by the end of the week, which performs this. Um, uh, okay, so a key part of this is something that's useful for, and th these provide some of the key relations, which I'm not gonna go into because it will, I don't want people to go back to sleep. Um, okay, um, a key point of this, which also applies to particle filter, is the following. This is really important even if you just want to apply particle filter. You can sample, ladies and gentlemen, not just for values that are likely the case at a given time, a distribution of the number of infectives that are probably out there, or the distribution for the number of people with suicidal ideation out there at a certain time. That's good. But what sometimes you want to pick is you want to sample from trajectories, which are stories about what has happened over time in terms of all the stocks. They paint a picture of what was the case, not just now, but 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And by sampling from trajectories, we have one plausible sort of history of what's happened. Or if applied at the level of a person, say uh, an offender, some picture of, of their biography that's plausible, okay? And here, sampling from a trajectory is like sampling from their story, from their history, okay? Um, and we can do that with particle filtering, and we do that for particle filtering as part of PMCMC, okay? And there's a really marked difference between this and just sampling at a certain point. The graphs that Xiao Yan showed, the graphs that Anihita showed, the graphs that Rifat showed, all of those, when it was depicting the the distribution, however alluring that graph was, say, uh, um, say Xiao Yan's uh, distribution for the number of infected people in the year 1945 for pertussis. There's a distribution she showed for that. And it was a joint distribution that's susceptible and expo exposed and recovered and so on. But, but we looked at the distribution, say, for the number of infected, the marginal distribution, and we saw a certain distribution. That distribution that she showed, mark my words, this is a very important point, only considered data observed to that point. It only considered data that was observed prior to that point. It was saying, given everything I've seen now in the logic of the model, how many people are likely infected now? That data observed to them is very powerful. It's very insightful. It can tell you a lot about what's going on in the system jointly with the model. It gives a very good picture. But what she did not show, what none of them showed, despite the strength of their work, was something more powerful yet. Something that incorporates data not only before that point, but after that point. You may remember me arguing on the second day that our understanding for what state we're in an underlying system, as illustrated by an HMM, I think Markov model, is illumined not just by data from before now. We want to know what state we're in now. It, it, we can gain a lot of insight by, by seeing the data before now. In fact, Tina, where is Tina? Oh, OK. Um, good for her. She's presenting results from an HMM doing exactly that. Perhaps as we speak, to her great credit, it was very insightful for her HMM. But I would argue that if, if later, let's say, let's say uh, a day hence, we want to know what state I was in now, it behooves us to know what happened after that. Remember, the, I gave a forward example yesterday, one that made Christine cringe, I think. Um, you know, uh, uh, about the uh, mental state of, of, of certain faculty, you know. Um, and, and I argued that, 
you know, if you want to know if an offender was suicidal at a certain time, for example, it behooves you to not only know what they've been doing up till this time, as useful that it, as that is, but if you want to know, you know, a year ago, were, were they were they subject to suicidal ideation? You might you might consider whether you know a year, not just a year back, what you knew then, but maybe you've known since then. Maybe a few days after the point of concern, um, there was that strange incident where you know they were they were found um, trying to to you know put their uh, put their clothes into what could be look like a noose or something like that, and people and. And, and that might shed light on what was going on a few days earlier, because it makes it a lot more plausible that a few days earlier they were also suicidal. Um, so my point is that, that when you want to know what's going on at a given point, um, it's great with particle filtering to consider all the data until now together with the model structure. It'll give you great insight. But what gives you better insight yet is, is combining that with what data you know after that point in the model structure. And particularly for systems which change slowly, you, you, um, this uh, this may be particularly important. So people's um, likelihood of, of uh, developing and getting beyond suicidal ideation, if that's a slow process, and you know two days later there was suicidal, um, you know, suicidal ideation, um, you, you can probably guess that two days earlier there was a high chance there was suicidal. That's what we tried to capture with our hidden mock journal model. Do you remember that? I argued. And that's what we can capture the particle filter model when we sample trajectories. When we go beyond just creating those graphs as beautiful as they are. Um, some of them, some of the graphs that Chad Yen showed look like the Northern Lights. It's awesome. Awesome. They could sell it in art galleries. Um, they just need those. How's that for an idea? Um, uh, <laughs> um, or maybe we could get into the Kenderdine gallery or something. Um, the point is that those were created using only data until that point. If we want to consider data after that point, the way to do it is to sample trajectories, entire stories about what's gone on over the time, and use them in by sampling them, show what was going on at earlier points of time. And it may be sharpened greatly. Um, we may not know how many people right now have latent TB in Saskatchewan. It may be quite hard to measure um, using data till this point. But if, if we start seeing large number of outbreaks within the next two years, it probably tells us there's a lot of people with latent TB right now. We just didn't know it. So, Having that hindsight is very important. So this sampling trajectories basically is what can give us the hindsight. It lets us, after the fact, at this later time, sample from entire histories of what was probably going on. Recognizing there's not just one interpretation for what happened, there's many possible interpretations. But maybe they share certain features that are undeniable, that are pinned down by the data. So sampling trajectories, whoa, okay, this is, um, must be having timings in here. Um, so sampling trajectories, ladies and gentlemen, gives us great information. Um, uh, as with HMMs operating retrospectively, we can get uh, a lot of information. And what we do to sample trajectories in particle filtering and by extension in its application particle on CMC, is we sample at the final time step according to their weight. No. 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 Just once. Based on the final weight. What happened in the MCMC step? The MCMC step we're sampling parameters. Okay. And the uh, and the particle filtering step we're assuming. So in the MCMC step we got a candidate parameter. You think this might be a good a good set of parameter values. And then the particle and the particle filtering step. So in the MCMC step, we're sampling a um, uh, a uh, parameter, a uh, candidate parameter, a candidate. We said that might be a good assumption about the parameters. 
And then in the particle filtering step, we're saying, okay, given that candidate value, we're going to perform a particle filtering. Given, the, given that we're going to assume those parameter values so the ones governing the system, we're going to we're going to run a particle filter, just like Shoyam did, just like Refat did, just, just like on a heat index. We're going to run a particle filter, and just like all particle filters, that particle filter is going to allow us to estimate the underlying latent state over time, the, the number of people, say, infected, recovered, et cetera, at each point in time. It's going to allow us to, to do that. But what we actually are going to get out of the particle filter, ladies and gentlemen, is not just a cross-sectional depiction of what was the case at a certain time, given the data to that point. We're going to sample the trajectory, okay? We're going to sample a, a trajectory from this. And what this means is we're going to take the weight. Remember in particle filtering? Do you remember it? The, we had weights associated with the particles. Remember that? The idea was the particle depicts a hypothesis about what's going on in the entire system, right? And associated with that is a weight, because we're using what's called sequential importance. That weight tells us know, how consistent this particle has been with the evidence till now, right? Up to this point, how consistent this has been. So we're going to take the weight at the final point, the final time, and we're going to use that weight as we're going to pick from trajectories according to the weight their final point. So in other words, each particle is going to be associated with the weight at the final time, and we're going to pick one of them with a probability according to the weight. Okay? I argued yesterday, you remember that little thing where I lined up a pen and a phone and so on, and I argued I can pick it's very easy computationally to pick things with a probability given by weight. It's, it's a very straightforward task. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to pick one of those particles according to its weight. But we're not going to just pick one particle. I don't want one stinking particle. I want the whole trajectory for that particle. I'm going to pick the particle in all of its lineage, its ancestry. I'm going to pick all of its ancestry going back from them, okay? So the idea here is we pick a weight of a, of a particle by weight at the final time point. We pick one of those particles and we look backwards to see its ancestry, where it came, whence it came, who its mother was, who its grandmother was, who its grand grandmother was all the way back till back beyond the first observation. Mm -hmm. Or back to the first observation, depending if it's at the first point. And the idea is that here, if, and this is from Sha Yan. She did a wonderful job describing this for her thesis. So do you remember in particle filtering, we had this process um, called uh, resampling? So the idea is, look, in particle filtering, each particle has this weight. In between observations, they just run forward. I, I argued it was like throwing a piece of, of, uh, of wood off the bridge and seeing it swirl in the current. It just carried by the model. So that particle filter evolves according to model, or that particle, its state evolves according to model logic. Hmm? And then, when, when we have an observation and, we, and we're going to perform resampling, perform the observation, we update the weight. That's this, this here. And then what's going to happen is we're going to perform resampling. And what's going to happen at resampling is we're going to do a multinomial draw from, from these guys according to their weight, meaning the ones that are successful will tend to be multiplied and the ones that are not so successful will tend to die out. Um, okay, and so here we might have these, for example, this particle gets picked um, by luck, it, it goes here, this particle is picked, it goes there. This one is a little bit confusing because as soon as it goes, it's, it's, it starts with weight equal that are, that are all one. 
and this will be what the weight it eventually evolves to. But it, maybe this one gets propagated, this one, this one gets propagated, that one. Some can get propagated multiple times, as you see here, but, um, but it doesn't happen to be shown here. So, so basically, some get uh, continued on, um, and then it runs and runs, and then the next resampling step, you have another shuffle that kind of goes on. It's not just a pure shuffle. Some die out. Some don't, some don't go nowhere, um, and uh, some continue on. So here, for example, is a resampling. These two die out. This one gets multiplied many times, et cetera. Okay? Um, so the idea here is that when we have resampling, we're going to build up a memory of where we come from. So here's a resampling step. This gets that's multiplied. Okay, I have some suggestions for how to improve this diagram. Um, but the idea is in this diagram, we're going to keep track of where the particles came from. Where the particles, so the idea is in, in resampling, we have this particle could come from that one, this particle could also come from that one. We'll keep track of their ancestry. We'll keep track who their parents were the previous, in the previous generation, and then who their parents were. We keep track of what's called the ancestry matrix. We keep track, this particle came from that one. I came from, I was begat from particle number 13. Maybe that's why it looks so weird. Um, and, you know, when particle 13 was begat from particle 27, and particle 27 was begat by particle 51. Um, and you get these ancestries. And like other human ancestors, like human ancestries or ancestries in the biologic world, you can have many, many descendants that come from the same ancestor. I, I have the same, I may have the same ancestral lineage as someone else in the room once you go back 20 generations. Maybe Christine and I. <laughs> same, same great, 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 great grandmother. Um, <laughs> so what a woman she must have been. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to be associated with me. <laughs> I am none of that in my family, she might say. Um, so, so you go back, you go back generations, and um, and you'll find their ancestry. And if we keep track of ancestry, that's what allows us to sample their lineage. Their, so we, we can, if we sample these according to weight, these these final ones. And I'm interpreting Xiaoyan's diagram here loosely. Um, but if I sample these according to weight, let's suppose I pick, you know, this guy. Well, that, that one, okay? Um, uh, what's its lineage? It goes here, and it went here, and it went here, and it went here. I can trace it back, and I can sample from its, from it, the particles it whence it came, and I can say what their state was. And that's a full trajectory, what I call a trajectory. It's what the situation was a year ago, or two years ago, or three years ago, or four years ago, or five years ago, for this youth in corrections, um, or youth under protection. Um, uh, and uh, similarly, we could do that for population, involving the pertussis state, or TB state. What was what was the TB state in terms of the number of latently infected, the number of susceptible individuals, the number of individuals with active TB, not just now, but sampling from now and tracing back their lineage. What was it a year ago? Did that, what did that particle believe it was a year ago? You notice here a particle lineage can go between many particle positions. The question is, where did it come from recognizing that it may have come from a different place um, uh, because of resampling, um, at, at, uh, across resampling events. So we can reconstruct what the number of people were latent to be, active to be, susceptible, et cetera, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, and give that whole picture as a hypothesis. That's one hypothesis, but it's a hypothesis of a story, of a history. It's a history that can be sampled. That's what we're sampling here, ladies and gentlemen. 
with trajectories. We're sampling histories. Mm -hmm. Histories that point to common, um, point to, to an understanding of what went on earlier. So to do this, we carry, we, we accumulate what are called ancestry matrices, okay? So we keep track of whence I came, who my parent, who my mother was in the previous generation, and we keep track of, for all previous particles, what their values were, what state they had at that point. And that allows us to reconstruct um, what's, uh, what was going on at earlier times. This is very powerful because it goes beyond what you can get. So uh, the, the, the ancestry, the traject by sampling trajectories and asking what was going on, say, in 1940 for pertussis, we get a much better picture than if we only considered the data up to 1940 for what was going on in 1940. We, we know what happened afterwards. We know shortly after 1940, there was a big outbreak, maybe. And that tells us, oh, in 1940, there must have been a lot of susceptibles. And that's what sampling trajectories gives us. These different trajectories are sampled by the final weight. Just as Leanne asked yesterday, the weight is a cumulative measure of fit. It captures the fit, of not just now, but over previous time points. And and uh, together with, with what comes from resampling. So I'm simplifying a little bit. But the idea is that the final weight by sampling according to it, we can sample trajectories, and that will give us a historic picture for what happened. So we'll have for a given youth, perhaps, uh, a historic picture, and there'll be different hypotheses, but they may all share certain features in a big way. Certain features at certain times, pinned down by evidence or pinned down by evidence combined with the logic of how, how things evolve. That is what we get out of this. Now this ancestry matrix is absolutely central to the function of PMCMC because we are sampling from trajectories, okay? So we're sampling from complete, uh, complete trajectories uh, here. Um, uh, and uh, so we're sampling from trajectories according to the weight. So you have to do this with PMCMC. It's a nice thing to do with particle filtering. And Anihita has uh, done some good work in building in ancestry matrices to one of her flu models, ancestry matrices that can then be used with to compare with PMCMC. Um, and Xiao Yan is, is working to build it into her models of uh, measles or pertussis or both. Trajectories, ladies and gentlemen, let us sample histories. And histories allow us to reconstruct what was going on in an earlier time using data not only to that point, but data from that point onwards uh, to, the to the current point. They're much more powerful than the cross-sectional view we have. Trajectories. And, and they're built into particle filtering. Um, okay. Um, I mentioned PMCMC is very computationally expensive. Um, uh, you have to perform particle filtering, commonly with thousands of particles for each MCMC iteration. And it's therefore essential that PMC, uh, PMCMC be performed efficiently. Fortunately, there's many paralyzable uh, elements, uh, evolution between observation points, and uh, in terms of distinct P uh, MCMC walkers. Um, for this, we can use GPUs, and, uh, and Luce is going to be applying them. For distinct Mar Monte Carlo walkers, we can use distributed computation, compute on different cores or different machines, similar to how Bo Pu who I believe is present, even as I speak, um, has used uh, parallelization to speed up the algorithms we'll be seeing this afternoon, CCM. Okay, um, additional components. Um, PMCMC 
like all these algorithms that we apply, there's kind of a there's kind of a, a skill to applying it well. Skill to apply it effectively. Um, and with PMCMC, there's um, a need to tune certain things. There's a need to watch acceptance rates and to try to get acceptance rates for accepting parameter values that are acceptably high. And one of the things that can really help with that is higher numbers of particles. So we ran our PMCMC with the opioid model um, with thousands of particles. The ones that had higher acceptance rates, like higher acceptance rates in the 20s, were ones that had particle counts upwards of 5,000 and often 10,000 particles. 10,000 competing hypotheses. We also, to up the acceptance rate, made use of broader likelihood functions. Um, so likelihood functions that were more accommodating. Um, but that has, has trade-offs. Um, uh, and um, I will say that um, the particle filtering, if you do it with a small number of particles, it's really how it's likely of accepting them for a given parameter value, theta, a given candidate parameter value, as chance of accepting, uh, accepting that uh, is really diminished with low particles because you get such variable trajectories out, um, you don't get very good strong evidence out of the particle filtering. But with more particles, you get higher quality particle filtering and therefore higher quality PMCMC. So I would suggest eating the higher costs associated with uh, higher particle counts. And um, uh, it's been our experience, so we're implementing PMCMC from the ground up. We have a highly efficient C code base, a language uh, C, which is, is used for it. Um, uh, and it's, it's quite efficient, um, but it's dwarfed by the speed that could likely come from GPUs and from parallel computation. So we're looking to that rather than being close to the metal, as they say, to, to really speed this up. Um, so uh, at this point, there's not a lot of really great tools for PMCMC, but we have frameworks if people are intrepid and want to apply them, uh, I'd be glad to share the code and they can use it. So what comes out of this? Well, we get pictures for what's going on over time in terms of the stocks. These are similar to what you get out of particle filtering. They sample what was likely the case at different times. And you also get samples out over time from the MCMC parameters that can be summarized into histograms, um, but they're from a joint distribution. And during PMCMC, you want to monitor these things to make sure they're what's called converging from an MCMC perspective. That you have enough samples from it that are well mixed, that they don't have big trends. So these are MCMC parameters. These are static parameters that over time we're trying different values of them. As, as the theta changes, we're exploring different possible values for these parameters. So here on the left, these, these uh, four here uh, on the left side, the time is the x-axis, value is the y-axis. On the right side, the x-axis is iteration, MCMC iteration, the y-axis is the value. Um, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. So we were building, and actually the, the plan is for Cheyenne to give a talk on this, where she's gonna explain where these came from in detail, so I'll, I'll comment on it right now. Um, and if she can give that talk, probably tomorrow, well, almost certainly tomorrow, um, you'll hear a lot more about it. But I'll explain it at a basic level. I will then, um, if, if she can't give the talk, I will. Her, uh, her daughter is unfortunately uh, sick, and so she's had to be at home today. But hopefully, hopefully she'll be here tomorrow. But if not, I'll, I'll deliver the talk. Okay. So um, 
we depicted um, within a system dynamics model, and I'll, I'll see if I can, I can actually um, pull it up right here. Uh, um, we depicted a system, um, and actually there's much better slides than this, I apologize. Um, we depicted a system um, associated with opioid dependence um, using a, a system dynamics model. Um, and fundamentally, what this model captured was individuals within a population um, as being in one of, of several states. This was version one. I think it evolved considerably since this. Um, but uh, even in this version, the basic features are present. We had individuals who, who went through um, uh, exposure to opioids for different reasons. Um, uh, post-operative use, so meaning uh, following an operation, and then according to chronic pain management, um, where uh, an individual might, might have chronic pain, they might engage in management of chronic pain through alternative mechanisms, yoga, meditation, um, acupuncture. Um, uh, these days in Canada, cannabis uh, is, is, has been promoted as as, as an alternative pain management strategy um, and, and other, other um, alternatives to opioids. Uh, an, an individual might, however, progress from chronic pain to having a, a current prescription, and some of those individuals then um, clear their chronic pain, maybe because of, of healing after back injury or what have you, and they flow back to a clean user status. Some of those individuals, however, continue on to a disordered status where they've developed often a, a, a higher tolerance, but more to the point, also a higher need for opioids, um, uh, that they feel a craving for opioids, I should say. Um, now, individuals who are in this uh, sort of situation of, of uh, disorder, um, uh, but are maintained by prescription, um, some of them may enter into treatment from their opioids, but other of those individuals, um, and actually uh, both of these, uh, uh, both of these um, are types of treatment, one involving continued opioid use and, and others involving uh, weaning them off of it using uh, suboxone um, uh, and, or other substances. So this individual may also go, um, because of discontinuation of their prescription, to, um, um, to a situation where they're no longer getting opioids um, uh, through their doctor. And an individual at this state is at high risk of going to a dealer for sourcing of their, of their opioids because they, they feel a high craving um, their body has become accustomed to taking these opioids and they go through withdrawal symptoms that are extremely, um, extremely uncomfortable and, and potentially wrenching. So individuals who have come off of, of uh, prescription opioids and are no longer, uh, no longer able to get them will often go to dealer sourcing of opioids. And the dealer sourcing of opioids is a great, is a particular danger because the opioids that they get through the dealers, amongst other things, are far less uh, carefully dose controlled than the ones they get through their doctor. And simultaneously, that's one thing. So they may get something from a, a dealer, which is, um, they think, you know, a moderate dose, but it's, it's actually got um, uh, fentanyl, um, uh, it, it, it looks like a uh, you know a Percocet or a an oxy um, an oxycodone or what have you, but it's actually a it has actually got some fentanyl in there. So the dosing may be actually quite high. And during the period without taking opioids, when they when they've been without them from the doctor, for example, their tolerance level may have come down quite a bit. In other words, how much their body can take to get the same. Um, you know, hit. And so taking, for example, uh, dealer sourced opioids may put them at high risk of an overdose because their body has gotten disused to getting them. 
Um, and from a dealer, you might only get them, if, you know, occasionally, particularly if you're in a rural area and you're waiting for a dealer to, to, um, to be able to, 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 to uh, be close enough for you to get them. And so individuals um, uh, who are getting dealer-sourced opioids um, uh, are, are often at very, very high risk. And our model drew on, so we had this model, and, and this was an early version of it. It evolved a lot to simplify it and to, to clarify it and to, to, um, to clean up some of the connections, et cetera. But fundamentally, we combined this uh, in a PMCMC context with multiple lines of evidence. Bryce was part of this, uh, uh, Yan was part of this, um, Refat was part of this, and others as well. And fundamentally, we had data coming in um, germane to mon several parts of this model. One of them related to prescription opioids and, and delivery of prescription opioids. Others related to deaths um, from opioid-related uh, causes. Um, others related to, to overdose counts, regardless of whether they, they led to a death. So we had uh, police reports of of opioid-related uh, overdose um, response um, calls, et cetera, or, or dispatch calls. Um, we also drew on data from online, looking at uh, people's uh, searches online involving, um, involving uh, dark web. So, so dark web is a, is a, um, uh, is, is a, an area of the web that is um, maintained in a fashion that um, is designed to be uh, difficult to, to easily uh, control or monitor. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very large source of illegal drugs, and with opioids being a large part. So we were looking at people searching for dark web related, um, uh, dark web related information and searching for opioid information online as well as searching for treatment options for opioids um, because we didn't uh, I don't I, my memory is off a bit about this but I think we had limited or poor information about treatment volumes because there were so many <coughs> private clinics in Cincinnati area etc we didn't have much so we had in short data on some some areas of this model from traditional data sources from online searching. Uh, Lugia was doing some work with uh, Twitter mining for, for Cincinnati as well to draw on that sort of data. And we have this data from police calls and uh, fire, fire department, ambulance calls, etc. So we put this together in, in an M a PMCMC model. And the idea was that we wanted to understand how many people were likely in each of these stocks, how many people what was the balance of people that were, for example, likely getting them through uh, dealer sourcing or individuals who might be getting prescriptions and were disordered? They, they claimed chronic pain, but they were, in fact, uh, disordered. Maybe they have chronic pain, um, or maybe they're confabulating and, and they're using it predominantly to, to get the opioids. Maybe the pain has largely disappeared, but, but a lot of it is being driven by by unpleasant withdrawal symptoms, et cetera. So we were interested in estimating using particle MCMC, you know, particle filtering related approach, how many people were likely in these states because it, it's hard to, you know, from, it, it, there's, there's no good data published on how many disordered people are seeing the doctor and confabulating pain. You know, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to get, um, to get evidence uh, on directly. So we were using particle filtering with these data sources, or particle MCMC with these data sources to estimate this latent state over time. That's what you see, that's what you see uh, here, um, is certain of these stocks. These are, these are distributions, this is time, and this is, for example, related to, uh, to dealer sourcing. And, and this is some particular, I think this is a flow related to it, but it's saying at a certain time, 
the value of this probably varies between this and this. It's a distribution with the, 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 the largest number being within this range here. And then over time, the, the evidence seems to point to a growing use of dealer sourcing um, in terms of, of obtaining opioids within the Cincinnati area. Um, and this distribution, you see it's widening and there's a corresponding widening of its certainty. So, you know, most, most of its hypotheses, most of the particles, the, these competing hypotheses that are, that are, that are um, competitive hypotheses that are, you know, effectively explain the data posit numbers uh, within this range, but um, there's, you know, uh, a distribution that could be as large as that. We have uh, drug overdose hazard rates. This was actually a period very interesting where uh, the introduction of fentanyl into Cincinnati caused a real spike in the, the number of overdoses that were occurring and it took time behaviorally for people to become aware of it and react to it, um, both societally and at an individual level. So you see this increase in hazard rate. These are depictions of, of sort of the, the, the PMCMC's deduction of what's going on at different points in this diagram over time. Those are the histories reconstructed using the data we did have data that Lugia and, and Shaoyan and Rifa, et cetera, helped harvest and Bryce helped, helped put into this. And these over to the right, these unseemly, um, uh, you know, scrawls, these are almost as bad as my writing, wouldn't you say? Um, um, that these things are showing over time as, as the, this is kind of a technical diagram, as it's sampling parameter values over time, it's getting different estimates for these parameter values. And you don't have to worry about the details of the ups and downs here. This is not over time. It's just, it's examining different values for this parameter that could be as high as this or as low as this. And really this would be much better summarized. I don't know why you put this. I guess this is called a trace plot. And I guess we put it there to show the sort of trace plots that come out of it. But you could get a histogram out of this if you were to kind of summarize how many of these are at this level or this level, you'd get a kind of a histogram coming out of it that would show where the value of this uh, lay in terms of the value of this parameter. This is for a parameter estimate. You know, for example, um, something having to do with the naloxone, um, how naloxone searches of Google Trends related to actual, um, uh, how, it, how it depended on the number of individuals um, who were um, who are making use of, of opioids, um, and this is related to back pain, relating the underlying prevalence of back pain to how much people are actually searching for it. So, um, so anyway, these were related to parameter values, and so it was trying to estimate that parameter value from a distribution. You know, it's exploring over time. This is what MCMC does, and kind of random walks it tries to explore different possible values of these parameters that are plausible. So that's what that was doing. But we'll try to have a talk on this tomorrow, um, where either I, uh, if I, if Shayan doesn't do it, I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did it. Oh. Okay. Yeah, but um, yeah, I would say like it's uh, like uh, the desire of MCMC is quite nice. Like I can see like by the patient. Yeah. The acceptance rate must be quite high. Yeah, they were by four. Well. No, they, they, for this, they may have been between 10 and 20%. They're actually not great, um, but uh, we were pretty satisfied with the trace plots that came out. Yeah, because I see they did change a lot. Yes. They do not stay. And that's right. They don't stay means the acceptance rate. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's, that is correct. Yeah. 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 Um, Christine is, I think, reminding me that the food is served. Yeah, it's after 10.30 and we should probably give people a chance to get up and walk around. Okay, so um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, we'll have a break now for, uh, for 15 minutes. And uh, we'll then
I think jump into is is Chen Yang here? Yeah. Uh, no, Chen Yang. Okay, she's going to give a talk at some point today or tomorrow. But uh, we'll go. I think we'll start into delay embedding. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you.